Micro Nano Education for everyone. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're at the Micro Nano Technology Education Center, and these are our uh, spring seminar series. Um, so today we're really excited. We're going to be hearing um, from Ann Bay Healer, who's going to be doing her. This is actually her second um, part B about the business industry leadership team that we're implementing at the MNTEC. Um, you know, and we, you know, that's something that's really important for us, getting industry actively engaged with our national center in micro and nanotechnology. So I'm really ecstatic to have Ann here. Uh, really going to be talking a lot about the knowledge, skills, and abilities and how we work with industry in order to determine um, which of those KSAs that we need to have a part of our micro nanotechnology programs. Um, so thanks, Anne, for doing the presentation and um, looking forward to hearing about uh, Built Part 2. You are welcome, for sure. Um, and this is Part 2. Uh, I am Amber Healer. I am the principal investigator for the National Convergence Technology Center, which is a fancy name for the National IT Center. We are in business for a couple of more years. Uh, and the bill was created as a part of our work. Uh, and then I am, speaking of ecstatic, I am ecstatic that uh, M Mintech is actually going to be implementing this. Uh, on the mega center level, that's actually pretty popular with the mega centers. And I know some of you don't like the terminology mega center, but the big national centers. We were funded during the first year that they decided that there were only going to be 10 national centers. And we are not the big national center. We're in a little bit smaller than that. But nevertheless, our work has been heavily, heavily based on working with strong business and industry leadership engagement. As part two, here's what we're gonna talk about today. Well, there'll be a really quick review, but it's not gonna cover very much, actually. It's mostly for those of you who have heard about BUILT but don't really know much about it. Then we're gonna spend our time on the planning, logistics, and timeline for the activities that lead up to the knowledge, skills, and ability meeting. We have a knowledge, skill, and ability meeting with the business, with the built people, once a year for each subdiscipline area. Has to be for a program, can't be for an entire division because you need the people that are working on that to be actual subject matter experts. You would not want someone who was like, for example, a chief executive officer for a giant company to be weighing in on specific knowledge, skills, and abilities for a sub area because most likely, well, there are exceptions to every rule, but usually they would not be subject matter experts. We'll talk about more details for holding the meeting. There are a lot of things to consider. We'll talk about how electronic voting works, and we're actually going to talk about how you actually experience it. You're going to get to vote on a six item. Uh, KSA list, which is obviously very small, but we didn't want to take very much of the meeting to do it. Uh, we will also uh, talk about what faculty do with what they get from the prioritized KSA list from the businesses and how you figure out what to do with curriculum. And that is going to have to be actually on the college level. Uh, on our national center level, we create the national KSAs and then we send it out to our partner colleges and the partner colleges are trained what to do with it from there in order to localize the information to their area. Then it's very important that there be feedback for the built members. We'll talk about that. And I'll show you a screen that is probably kind of hard to read if you're on a laptop, but hopefully you can put it on a bigger screen and you can blow it up and see what I'm talking about on how to provide the feedback. Let it be said that we do in fact, sorry, we do in fact limit what we give to our business members because to the knowledge, skills and abilities that they want, because very often when we get them involved in the bowels of the particular courses, sometimes they think that's really, really easy and we all know it's not but they, they, they kind of go down a rabbit hole, so to speak. So we, we keep it on the KSA level. And then another important feature of the model is to have trends meetings. If you know a college that's fast, I would like to know them. 
because we are not fast at implementing curriculum and some of us are faster than others, but even so it's gonna usually take several months. So what's a built? This was back in the day at the Convergence Technology Center. That's me up front leading the business people. Even before we had electronic voting, it was very tedious to count hands and it's much, much nicer now that we do it electronically. Anyway, they're uh, a business advisory council, I say on steroids, because it requires the employers to co-lead the work. And it helps a lot that we use a structured repeatable process so that they know what they're dealing with, they know how they're working with us, uh, and we keep doing the same process year after year. Bare bones essentials of the BILP. If you just know the acronym, you may not know that there are only a few requirements. One is that put it, you're putting the businesses, and by the way, anytime I say business, it can be business, it can be industry, it can be employer, those are all synonymous from the BILP. Sorry, I keep going ahead. Um, but they need to be in a position of co-leading programs. Again, not whole departments or divisions. And typically we do quarterly meetings. We may actually do three times a year for the MinTech group. They start with a pro forma list of knowledge, skills, and abilities that we think they want graduates to have. And they prioritize that list and then add, change, and delete items on the list. The subject matter experts do the prioritization, usually with faculty in the room or at least on the call. And most of our meetings have been partially hybrid for a very long time because we're a national center and we don't necessarily want to have people flying in for the uh, KSA meeting. So we'll usually have some people in the room and some people that are actually on web meeting as well. We also want them to predict labor market demand. And again, that's probably more meaningful when you do it on a regional level, because it doesn't make sense to train people really, really well for something that is not needed in your region. We also like to have them predict trends because trends, when they talk about trends, they're talking about things way into the future and kind of giving us a heads up. And that helps us to be able to respond. In terms of the essential elements from faculty, the faculty, once the items are prioritized, need to cross-reference those KSAs to existing curriculum and figure out gaps. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. And then actually do the updates to address the KSAs needed by the businesses, if possible. If they cannot be done, if the changes are just too much, then it's okay to provide feedback to the built not only on what you did do, but also what you couldn't do, because sometimes they can solve that problem too. For example, they may want you to add a course for which you do not have a faculty member qualified to teach, and maybe you don't even have an adjunct available. Maybe they can provide you an adjunct. Sometimes they want something that's going to require a whole lot of equipment, and if it requires a whole lot of equipment, I don't know many of us that have unlimited equipment budgets, so sometimes they can help with that as well. Um, and by the way, please put your name and your college in the chat window. And if you have questions, I should have said this earlier, please put your questions in the chat window too. And Billy is going to funnel those over to me along the way. So the suggested arrangement that we have for Mintech is one super built meeting a year. And the super built meeting is more like a national advisory meeting. Um, it's overall employers from all the various different sub areas. Uh, we think that's really, really important to have as well. But then a KSA analysis update meeting per year for each of the sub disciplines. And so far we have not defined those sub disciplines. Uh, we've talked about several, but we haven't really defined them. It's also going to be important to train the membership colleges to adopt or adapt the built so that they can localize the KSA analysis and actually make a, uh, changes on college curriculum that affects students. And then two trends meetings a year, maybe only one, uh, to talk about future trends. Uh, the meeting is led by the employers with faculty asking questions, lots of questions. And also faculty and, grant can, faculty and grant staff or college staff can present any updates in the program that they want to share 
with the belt members for them to know what's going on and for them to ask questions. Okay, logistics and timeline. The date and time. When you're starting from scratch, you wanna pick a date that's five or six weeks into the future. So there's plenty of time to get everything done. And some suggestions just from our experience, and you can modify this however you want to modify it. But the reality is what we've learned is it's not a good idea to put it near a holiday. Whoops, I keep going forward. Not a good idea to put it near a holiday because the employers like extended holidays too. We usually pick a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, unless you know that the belt members will show up. We usually do not pick Monday or Friday, although I have some belts that work for various different industries where they know they'll show up on Friday and that's fine to do it on Friday. We also pick 8.30 in the morning unless you know they'll show up at a different time. One time I flew in to lead a brand new belt for a college and before I got there, they had over 10 people signed up to be there for a one o'clock meeting. And it turns out only one of the business people showed up. Well, that's probably not getting a cross section of your employers if you only have one business person. So we had to do it over. Do pick a convenient site if you're going to be face to face. You need AV capability, you need screens, sound systems, conference phone. I always have a conference phone for those who can't or don't want to attend in person. Uh, they can always attend via Zoom. Uh, originally, it was just a conference phone for purposes of just hearing them, but now we can actually link that into our Zoom and it works very, very well. Uh, very important for there to be wireless access in your room unless you've got a whole bunch of computers sitting around that are hardwired. Uh, I like having on a face-to-face -face meeting, having a check-in table uh, outside the door and have someone else help with the greeting and making sure people are checked in and are comfortable. By the way, I always provide coffee, even if I don't provide them food, always provide coffee. That seems to be the fuel that keeps us all going. Do provide some room for the catering, even if it's just coffee. And in terms of choices, if you've got a college that has multiple sites, you would want to have a short driving distance for the attendees who will be face-to-face. -face. And again, on the National Center, probably almost everything is gonna be virtual anyway. Although you still have to have AV, you still have to have um, probably a conference phone of some sort, maybe. Um, when wireless internet access, et cetera. I think you can figure out what you don't have to have if you're doing it virtually. The invitations, we talked about that last time. We talked about coming up with a value proposition. Why do the business people want to be involved with you? Not just go to them with your handout saying, hey, we want, we want, we want. How about instead of that, how about going to them and say, hey, we can increase the pipeline of qualified individuals or this particular subdiscipline area for which you're having trouble hiring. Uh, that's one of the value propositions, but figure out your value proposition, include the WIFM, again, talk about whether there'll be food or not. And again, even some people that are doing the work virtually are providing things like DoorDash coupons for the people to uh, be involved. Um, and then uh, if it's face-to-face, -face, do they need to bring their own laptop or tablet for the voting or can you provide them computers? Very important to ask for RSVPs that go to somebody who's able to track the responses and answer questions. Other pointers, uh, important again to have somebody track the, resp the responses. It's also important to say how much time you're asking from these folks. Um, it's usually less than eight hours a year, three to four hours for the knowledge, skills, and abilities meeting, depending on the number of KSAs you have. And, and it's also important when you initially start working with people to not hit them with every single thing that you want them to do for your college or for your center. Kind of ease into it until they see the benefit for themselves. We do print invitations so they stand out in incoming mail, hand signed, hand addressed stamped, how many people get mail like that? Not often, but people are oftentimes not in the office. So it's important to email those invitations as well. And in terms of timing, three and a half to four weeks in advance would be useful. 
follow up on the RSVPs. If you don't get an RSVP, it does not mean that the employer is not interested. It could mean they just didn't even see the email. So it's important to phone those who haven't responded three weeks in advance. And then about a, two weeks in advance and again, two or three days in advance, send them an email with all the credentials for Zoom as well. Don't forget to invite faculty to attend. I had a KSA meeting recently that I was helping to facilitate and no faculty were there. Well, faculty need to be there because that gives them the opportunity to hear from uh, the source, from the employers, exactly what they need. And that's a whole lot more credible than if we work with the employers and then we share that with faculty. Better to invite them if you can. Also good to record the meetings. Uh, also good to have a pre-meeting with faculty so they can ask any questions. Sometimes we have a few challenges because faculty think, ah, oh, we're giving leadership of our program away to the business people. Au contraire, not, not correct. Uh, we're having the business people say what they want. And then the faculty are able to then take that information and figure out what they want to do with it with respect to curriculum. Okay, I also want you to create your KSAs in advance and then convert it to an electronic form as soon as you possibly can no later than a week before the KSA meeting because you need to try the form out and make sure it works. If you need someone or need some guidance, there is a video on connectedtech.org, which is the national CTC site. You can go to that, look at the video. There is pretty detailed information given. Uh, and it's also important to test out the form and have lots of people vote and check to make sure it's working properly. So now you get to do what you want to do here. I can't cut and paste that now. Well, I can if I do this. Sorry. I, I got the last one for you. Okay, good, terrific. So you're putting it in chat, good. Oh, no, no, not that one. You need the form, the voting form. Can you do that one? Yep, Billy. give me one second. Okay, it'll make it easier for people to click on it. This is a six item KSA list. It's actually quite small, but it will give you the opportunity to see what your employers would experience when they are voting. Got it. So you can just click on that and do the six questions. It's IT, it doesn't matter, just vote. Just you don't even have to really spend too much time figuring out what is said. Just vote because what I want to do is show you the results. This is the form. You all are looking at that and then this is where the results go. I'll give everyone maybe two or three more minutes to finish this up. Again, it doesn't matter what you vote. The idea is to show you how it works. Votes are still coming in, that's good. looking pretty stable. So I'm going to go ahead and start talking about what we're looking at. Once you vote on the form, your vote is tallied into the appropriate column, whether you voted a four or three or a two or a one. And what happens at that point, we can look and see who voted. Uh, it tells us what time everybody voted. Here are the, if I Look at this column that tells us all the votes that occurred on the item number one, two, three, four, five, six. And if I move on over, whoops, sorry. What I was gonna point out is we also get the email address 
from the folks and that allows it to go back to them in their email as to how they voted. Now, it's also important because while we say that usually you should not have faculty vote in this, I've had problems where maybe faculty came into the meeting late and they voted anyway. Usually it doesn't matter to the overall averages at all, but it can. And so what can happen, uh, I had one college that a couple of their faculty were late and they voted and they did not want their vote included. So you can go in and you can take out their vote by taking out or actually blanking out the lo their line where they voted. So that's possible too. And then I'll show you some of the real detail at the bottom. Sorry, this is probably going to make you dizzy watching it go by. The actual formulas to count the votes. Oh, I don't want to add more. The formulas are below this. Sorry, I don't see the formulas here. But the, the video that you do actually does show those formulas as well. Then in the meeting itself, what we do is show the built, the results, and they're always very anxious to see what the averages are and where their rating, ratings fell. Typically, every item that is an average of three or above is in fact supposed to be included in the curriculum or, or supposed to be considered for inclusion in the curriculum. Anything under three, maybe not. By the way, the voting is four is most important and four, I think about it as saying, this is something that has to be in curriculum, three is a should be and two is a nice to have. One usually means no, we don't really want it. So what happens is the built members at this point can in fact, discuss any item they want. And we scroll through the whole list. Sometimes there's 150 items. We scroll through the whole list doing maybe 10 at a time. They can discuss any item they want. They can change the wording on it. They uh, then have to get agreement by the other people if they want to change wording. Sometimes we take an impromptu revote on an item. Uh, and further, I as leader or facilitator, you as leader as, or facilitator can bring up any item you want. Well, I gave you no guidance on how to vote on these. So anything that has votes in all four items, four, three, two, one, I have to wonder why. So I would ask the business team, somebody that voted a four, would you like to say why you voted a four? And somebody that voted a one, why did you say, you, why did you decide to vote a one? because it's not that either vote is wrong, but it could be that they didn't understand the particular statement. And on the other hand, it could be that their businesses are just different. And the business that one represents thinks it's a really important concept and the businesses that are represented on the other side um, maybe don't think it's an important concept. So it's either a difference in the type of business that's voting or it could be just a misunderstanding about the statement itself. I'm gonna stop for questions right now. Do you have questions at this point? Because this is the essence of making built work and work smoothly. No questions? Totally clear. And I have a quick question. Okay, go ahead. Um, if you click on one of the um, tabulated um, votes numbers, yeah, will we see the formula there? Yes. Okay. That's what I was trying to show you. The, oh. There are count if statements at the bottom. 148 of or nine. nine, okay. Yeah, it's gonna be at item uh, 149 where the responses are. And that was beyond what I had set up to show you and I didn't wanna suddenly add additional items when I might make it blow up. Huh. This it. whole process is not hard. In fact, if you have administrative assistants around, they probably know how to do it a whole lot better than I do. But I will tell you that doing it is a bit tedious and you can mess it up. I have a question. 
Okay. Um, will you be sharing this, the Google Forms? I can share us? them, but the more beneficial thing is for you to listen to the video. And if you're really into it and want the detailed PDF, you can have it. That one is the, the video and the P, detailed PDF of instructions is specifically for the KSAs right now that are created by the National Convergence Technology Center. So there are some steps left out. I am working on rewriting some of it or adjusting some of it, and I'd be happy to send it out to all of you. So your recommendation is for each center or project that's here to take the instructions you've provided, which are significant, considerable, and create their own, make sure it yes. fits for them. I okay. don't have a problem sharing these forms too. Yeah. Uh, not a problem either. Uh, it's just not self-explanatory about how it all works. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And it's so much better than having to count hands. We were counting hands in the room and counting hands via the chat window. It was a mess. It takes probably an hour and a half to two hours less for the meeting each year. It's great. I've seen both methods and I can attest to what Anne has just said. This is a major innovation. Right. Well, and it's not our innovation. We just figured out how to apply it. Actually, um, one of our program directors, Christina Titus, is the one who did figure it all out. Uh, those of you who think you can use Microsoft Forms, you can, but you can't get quite as much detail. I facilitated a group with Microsoft Forms only. Uh, you could get the votes, you could get the average. It was difficult to get the distribution, like I showed you the distribution, where it showed the number of votes for four, the number of votes for three, two, one. You can show how all the different, um, you can show how all the votes are there, but you'd have to, like even for our group with 18 people, going down the list and trying to figure out the distribution on the fly would be difficult. And somebody probably knows how to do it better than I. I am not telling you I'm the guru of this. I just know how to make it work. Um, I, Ann? Yes. We have a, we have a question in, in chat from Elaine Kraft and she's wondering how to deal with state level control of curriculum when colleges don't always have local options to make significant or perhaps any modifications to the curriculum? That is a terrific question, Elaine. Even with state control of curriculum, any given professor can probably customize a little bit with respect to each course. Now, putting in a whole new degree, putting in a whole new course, you're right, you probably can't do that without state approval. But for example, in the state of Texas, we have what's called a workforce education course guide manual that defines the SLOs that must be taught in a course that has a particular number and call sequence. But what it does not do is it does not say the faculty member can't augment that information. So this is still a very valid thing to go through because it could be something as simple as uh, making the labs more uh, robust according to what the employers want. There are still changes that can be made. You're right, if you're talking about a whole new program, this is a way to put it together if the state doesn't have a program. Um, and if you need to do a whole new course, most of the states have a way that you can do an elective or a special needs course. I, I'm generalizing because you're right, there are state rules all the way around. And I see a volunteer uh, from Janet Pinhorn to help with generalizing the information. And that was just to me, but that's awesome, Janet. I will take you up on that. Okay, remember, voting should not be done in advance. On one of our grants, it's an IT skills standards grant, and we work with an association in the state of Washington. And the fellow there said, well, we don't really need to get all these business people for you. We'll just send your voting form out and we'll get votes from 100 or 200 or 300 people 
um, and then you can work with it and figure it out. The problem is a couple of problems. Number one, four is most important. When I send it out in email, even to the existing belt members that we have, I oftentimes have them flip that and they think that one is most important, even though they just read it in the email. So you can have someone in the voting that all of their numbers are exactly reversed and it takes a little bit of time to have them revote and it's kind of a pain. But the more important thing is voting is only a piece of it. Voting gives you some numbers to work with to lead your discussion, but we always, every single time, learn more from the discussion than we do from the actual voting. So in the discussion, they can talk about items they want to add. They can talk about items they want to change. You can get clarifications on the voting. Uh, and we're doing one particular uh, focus on using this same approach on the skill standards grant that we have now learned that uh, even though we put the KSA list together with a focus on the future, that we didn't focus far enough on the future. Uh, the first meeting we had was very detailed in the discussion in terms of what extra things needed to be added to the list. Okay, preparing for an in-person meeting, in -person meeting, actually preparing for a virtual meeting also. Pick a facilitator who understands BILF and won't be defensive. Even, I mean, and faculty can do it, but they have to be willing to allow the employers to basically say that they don't agree with something in the current curriculum, or they don't agree that uh, one of the things that the faculty member, perhaps the lead faculty member, thinks is real important, maybe the group says it's not so important anymore. So I've run into a problem where the faculty member really wanted to defend the turf. So it's nice to have a facilitator who understands the process and can co-facilitate along with the faculty member. Best room setup is a U, employers at the U, faculty at the U as well, but if there's no room, there can be a U outside of a U. And again, always nice to have recognition as to who they are, table tents, name tags, all of that sort of thing. Again, back to this picture. Surely we're gonna be able to get back to face-to-face -face someday. And uh, I don't really like the idea of voting by the hands anymore. But I do think the discussion is a little bit richer when they are face to face and they can basically agree to disagree on some things or argue some things out. Uh, we typically, again, have at least as many people outside of the room involved, both employers and colleges. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a hybrid thing always, uh, but it is really good to have good discussion and I think face-to-face -face is still best. Okay, the agenda and flow for the meeting. Need to have a welcome from the program lead supervisor or above. It's amazing that, well, it's not amazing, I guess. Uh, they love to hear a welcome from the president or a VPAA or at least a dean, uh, somebody that confirms that what the faculty member is wanting to do makes a lot of sense. It's always nice to have a self-introduction situation for all in the room and all on the web. One of the reasons the built members participate with one another in some cases is so they can make other connections within the industry. So if you're making other connections within the industry, uh, it's nice for each person to introduce themselves, talk about their role for just a little bit and talk about their company for just a little bit. That also helps in the discussion to kind of set context for where they're coming on with coming from with their com comments. Uh, I always put a brief explanation of the built approach and how to vote. This is where I will tell them again, be very, very careful. Four is top, one is not. <laughs> um, and having just said that, having them vote via the electronic form 
uh, doesn't take that long. Even for 150 items, it's more like 20 minutes max, maybe not even that. So it's worth doing it at the top of the meeting just to make sure everybody's on the same page. And then most of the meeting is talking about discussion. Each item, again, I don't go item by item. I go a screen at a time, which is maybe 10 or 12 items at a time. And anybody in the room, anybody on the uh, conference call, web meeting, anybody can bring up anything they want to talk about. That, those are the ground rules. And then if I'm the facilitator, I will bring up those items that have a wide distribution of votes so that we fully understand what's going on. Be sure to have breaks. I didn't put that in there. I usually don't tell them exactly when the break is gonna be, but about halfway through, you wanna give them a break, have them stand up, jump around, go get a cup of coffee, have a bio break, even if they are uh, virtual. I mean, it's amazing to me that some folks think that we can go back to back Zoom meetings all day and never move from our chairs. Uh, I know that that's kind of tedious for some of us, but the reality is that um, you need to provide a few breaks, not long. You can do a five minute, 10 minute. If it's face to face, I like to provide more. I like to provide more like 15 minutes where they will talk to one another on the break time where the built members bond with the built members. We have Q&A all the way through and definitely close with a Q&A to make sure that those in the room that have questions or on the line that have questions actually ask those questions. Further, it is really, really, really important that you have it set up so that the facilitator calls on the quieter built members. Uh, I had a meeting once and didn't call on somebody who was quiet and he never came back. And when I talked with him later, he says, well, you never ask for my opinion. Well, I actually did, but I didn't ask him specifically. So it's important to make sure you call out, not call out, but call on and ask if the quieter people truly have something to say and just don't feel like speaking up. We also schedule the next meeting to provide feedback to the build. We schedule it at the meeting we're in. That's the time you can find out if there are major events going on in the industry in the area and that people can't attend for some reason. And then adjournment. If I ask for three hours, at the end of three hours, even if we're not done, we're done. We stop, we handle everything else through email, through phone calls, whatever. The other thing though is, let's say you schedule it for three hours and it only takes two hours. How many people do you know that are upset when they get an hour back? No one, okay? So it works very well to schedule enough time. You know, there are limits. I probably wouldn't go over about three, three and a half hours max because it's really, really hard um, for people to commit that much time because you want the really busy business people, employer people, industry people. You don't want the people that can have the big, long, all day long meetings. Uh, you want the, the movers and the shakers. And there's a question that I am seeing in the chat that says, hey, if we're starting from scratch, would it be better to do one for most important, four for least important? That's fine, you can do that, you can flip it, it's fine. But I'd still not send it out in advance, I'd still explain it because people still misinterpret. That's just all there is. Now, once the prioritization is done, we take the Zoom recording and we summarize anything new, any comments about changing, all of that. We summarize all of that and provide the spreadsheet with all the votes as well as the form just so that, well, they don't need the form really. That information is in the spreadsheet. And we give it to the faculty members along with the discussion points summarized. The faculty are in charge of determining the cutoff score. Normally it's 3.0, but I have to say that this is not a scientific process. What happens is 
and this is really weird, especially when you have people going face to face. Let's say the, the outside weather is snowing and icy and in some places, and they had a difficult time getting through the traffic, uh, getting to your college. Well, interestingly enough, the overall numbers are always just a bit lower. Call it human nature, call it whatever you want. But when they've had to go through difficult times for whatever reason, and that's probably any time you do COVID uh, affected meetings. Anyway, it's probably a good idea to have the faculty compare the discussion points and the comments to the prioritizations because sometimes they'll prioritize something such that the average is under three, but then the discussion makes it really clear that it's very important. I would, for the faculty, take the Google Sheet and I'd hide those KSA rows under the cutoff, whatever the cutoff number is, hide them entirely. And then from there, putting the classes in an existing prog program in the columns next to the average, just list the, col the courses out, one, two, three, four. And then for each course and prioritize KSA, put an E if the course provides exposure or a T for thorough coverage. Now, this is not too scientific either, but I had a whole lot more complicated way of identifying what the course covered and it got too confusing. So it's basically, is it an introduction or is it thorough coverage? And then you end up with a spreadsheet that has all of the T's and the E's and that sort of thing. And at that point, um, I would copy whole rows of KSAs with no E's and no T's, because that's in fact a gap that you need to figure out what to do with. And then I would also copy whole rows of KSAs that only have E's to another spreadsheet to discuss with the bill to see if exposure is, en is enough. Very often there will be knowledge areas, they'll cover more things in the knowledge areas than they really want people to have skills to do. So sometimes it's fine to have exposure only. That's fine, you can do that, but it's a good idea to check with the bill and make sure that they're okay with that. So this is the form that I told you we were gonna talk about and it's kind of hard to read, but this is a sample way of providing feedback. I will take you through this. At the top, I have the networking AWS, AAS degree, Associates in Applied Science, sorry. And then the certificates. There are a couple of certificates attached to the networking degree. Same thing on convergence, there's a degree and there's two certificates. Then we listed all the courses that were affected in all of the various programs that are listed up there. And colored the item, oops, sorry, yellow, and put the course number in there if it was included in that credential. And then up at the top for each degree and each certificate, we, I just put the K's in here because it gets bigger than this if you put the S's and the A's. But the K, we put the K's at the top so that they could tell that in fact, K1, K2, K4, 5, 7, et cetera, were covered in that degree. And you'll notice that, um, well, actually you may or may not notice because it's very complicated to, to read those little letters. But sometimes you'll find if you've got several related degrees that are in a given program, maybe one of the degrees will cover one KSA and another one won't. What we also do when we provide feedback to the employers is we provide them that spreadsheet that has the distribution of votes and the averages and the one that you have put in the E's and the T's by course. That way they can actually look at it and see that they were heard. Again, the built model is a model for engagement. Yes, it's a model for alignment of curriculum, but it is a model for engagement as well. And if a business person has been act, asked to co-lead a program and they give you their very best information and then you ignore it, they're not gonna to wanna to come back. But if you show them 
what you've done with it, then they are usually very, very happy. The other piece is showing them the items that have a gap and what you did to cover it. And then also showing them the items that were just exposure um, to ask if that's enough. Questions at this point? There's some resources. Um, I have semi-retired from Collin College. I'm still the PI for the National IT Center and for the IT Skill Standards Grant. So I'm still working there a lot of hours a week. Uh, but I have, as my son says, thinned my hours a little bit. There's another grant I'm working with that provides resources. Pathways to Innovation.org has three complementary uh, initiatives. One of them is the Built Academy that is not appropriate for a national center to use because it's, it's a little bit light for that, but it can help a college that is wanting to do just one specific program and do a built for that. It can help on that. We are currently already working with our cohort for 2021. So the next cohort actually will start in December of 2021 or really January of 2022. But if you're interested, go to pathways.innovation.org, pathways2innovation.org. And then there are built resources from the National Convergence Technology Center. They are under this link. There is a, another video that gives some more information. There is a trifold that's there and various other support items that are there. And if you have questions, you can in fact um, use my email and you can reach out to me. I'm very happy to chat with you. I sometimes will do some specific work with a given college, depends on how big it is. I don't mind donating a lot of time, but if you're wanting to do a whole program, I probably would ask for a contract. And I'm not advertising for that at all, not at all. Um, I'm very happy for people to be able to do it with materials and resources that are provided. Um, Billy, can you help me put these uh, links? Well, I can pack some of them in. I can get them. I'll do that. Okay. All right. Uh, Billy's going to put the, the, the links, Bob, into the uh, chat box. And now it's what questions do you have? Where are you thinking about using this? I mean, you, I'm available. I, we actually schedule longer than this, and I don't think it's going to take it. Uh, so I'm very willing to answer questions. No questions. What's your feedback? What do you think? Uh, so I've, I've got a, a question. This is Bob again. Uh, you know, we've done uh, sessions that are usually called compression sessions. They're similar to DACOM. And it seems that some of the techniques that are involved with that are used here, although there's a, a periodic aspect to your meetings that uh, differ from the compressions of the DACOMs. Those typically tend to be one-time events. Right. Are there, other, are there other differences and similarities that you could share with yes. us? Yes. Yes, there are. Uh, I'm actually a certified DACOM facilitator, whatever. Uh, what I find is to do a full DACOM, even if you're only going to do it one time, um, and I was unable along the way to get the, as I called it, the movers and the shakers, the real leaders that I really wanted to be involved to spend enough time for a DACOM. Compression planning is a little faster. Um, the other side of it though, is that doing this annually is very important because what happens is the industry folks are able to weigh in annually and you're talking about incremental changes to try to implement as opposed to a massive change all at once. We're in IT and I will say that if the courses you're teaching in IT are the same today as they were 12 months ago, you're behind. 
Almost because hourly things, changes come. Yeah, almost hourly, certainly monthly anyway. So we do the, the full KSA analysis once a year. The built is willing to do it twice a year. But what we found was based on the curriculum uh, scheduling for colleges, the colleges didn't think they could really use the material or use the prioritization more than once a year because they really could only go to the curriculum committee once a year. Now, we, the trends meetings that occur, those are not included in DACOM and not included really in compression planning. Those are very, very valuable. Uh, I will say that our trends meetings, we have three of those a year. Uh, and those trends meetings oftentimes have 100 people in attendance or close to it, half business and half uh, educators. And for those meetings, what I normally do is have, um, have people pulsed already to be ready to change or not change to provide the trends. The one more slide on the trends is, is making sure that uh, on the trends meeting that you have employers that are already pulsed to be able to provide updated information. They're all getting it, but if you catch them off guard and ask them to talk about it without basically letting them know in advance, they maybe will not consolidate their thoughts and maybe won't be able to participate. We also sometimes have presentations uh, at these trends meetings, short ones, but we have, for example, someone who is a data analytics guru who is talking about the farmers and the miners uh, of data analytics. Very interesting presentation, super interesting presentation. We also use the trends meetings to provide feedback to the businesses. For some grants, you have to have business approval for a lot of the things that you're doing and you can do that during the trends meetings as well. Comments this is, this is Terrell. I would, like, I would like to say that, you know, DACOMs and skill standards you, um, provide, the, the main purpose is to provide information from industry to education to have updated curriculum. With the built, and I think that, and, and uh, I'd like to hear you talk about this. It seems to me with the built, that is not the primary purpose here. The primary purpose of all of that is to have a reason to talk to industry and have them talk to us that they care about. And so the, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a twist on the whole thing. It is. The main emphasis is engagement. Uh, what else do you like to have employers do for you? I like to have them mentor students, mentor faculty members, be speakers in our classes, be speakers at our conferences, uh, lots of other different things. This is about engagement. And I will tell you that if you talk to our built members uh, that are active, super active, we have about 100 on the list, maybe 40 that are active at any given year. Um, if you talk to them, what you're gonna find out is, yeah, they're excited about aligning curriculum and it makes them more interested in hiring the people that graduate from the program because basically it's their program. But it's also a vehicle for talking to them, learning about the future, also a vehicle for involving them in these other optional activities, such as mentoring students, mentoring faculty, providing professional development. We provide professional development for a week every summer. And usually there are six tracks and usually one or two of them are fully, fully funded by the built members, which is great. Saves money, gets the latest information. It's very useful. But you're right, Bob, there are some uh, similarities. Similarities, but uh, I've basically gravitated towards this approach because it takes the least amount of time for the maximum amount of engagement and gives you up-to-date information at least annually. Hey, Anne, this is Mel. How are you doing? Yeah. Great, hey, what how are you? Good, thank you. I think what, as you were listing that, 
a thought came to mind that it also helps identify emerging trends before we yes. ever hear about them in education because exactly. they're on the front lines. Okay. They are. Well, and that's why we, we talked about it last time, but the people that you put on your belt need to be high level technical executives responsible for keeping their uh, company in business so that they, because they've got to be knowing about what the trends are uh, going forward. We also involve hiring managers because they know firsthand what they're wanting to hire today and hopefully have a bit of a view for the future. We also like to put technicians on the belt if the technician graduated from your program. And that's not necessarily because those people in particular see the future, but they are a great bridge to your educational resources with the other belt members. Uh, the people that we don't like as the only representative for a company are the HR reps. We're not really into that. HR can be involved, but we would like them to be the second rep from a given company. Uh, and there's another question in chat uh, from Elaine Kraft again. Um, if a college is required to periodically conduct data, okay. how do you build, how do you do a built to without exhausting all involved? You can bury a, you can actually change the approach here so that the built does the DACM. Um, I've actually done that with people before. It, it, I don't present on it because it's, yeah, I just don't do it. Few colleges absolutely have to do DACMs. They need to do job skills analysis and that's what this is. So, but you know, I understand that it sometimes is required and you, there's a way to adapt it for this. I'm happy to talk to you about it. And if others want to know, send me an email. It's avahealer at gmail. What other questions might you have? Billy and Jared, I guess I'll give it back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ann. This has been a great presentation. Um, the built is is something that we're very passionate about at the Mintech Center, and we look forward to continuing to work with you to to build ours and and make it as best as it can be for the National Micro Nanotechnology Education Center. And I want to thank everybody for coming.